All right, welcome back to Rockford Reading Daily. We are on episode 112, I believe. Uh, We are continuing to read High Risers by Ben Austin. Just trying to make sure I got all my, got the audio set up right before we get started here. Okay. Vince Lane returned to Cabrini Green three weeks after speaking at Holy Family. On the campus of the nearby Moody Bible Institute, Cabrini residents joined him at an all-day, quote, planning summit, end quote. Asked to enumerate their concerns, tenants said they worried that they were being tricked off their land. They were allowed to live on the near north side so long as the area was full of crime and poverty. Now with investment and upkeep, with improved policing and new amenities, they didn't believe that they would be allowed to stay to enjoy it. Lane led three more meetings at Cabrini the following month in a town hall for all residents. Did the tenants feel like they were heard? They did. They joined committees and neighborhood advisory councils. They met with an independent facilitator Lane hired to keep the dialogue going. They were convinced that they were included in what the CHA was now calling the, quote, rebirth of Cabrini Green through resident empowerment partnership, end quote. This first phase of Cabrini Green's development would cover only nine of the 70 acres, just the northern end of the Cabrini Extension site along Division Street. For more than a year, the residents in the, quote, empowerment partnership, end quote, dutifully completed the application for the $50 million Hope 6 grant. In the days before turning in the application, they traveled by bus to a suburban Hyatt Hotel, 30 minutes outside Chicago. The weekend planning session began with the motivational screening of Fired Up, a documentary that had been made about the 1230 North Burling resident managers. Then in groups, they hashed out the particulars of how security would operate in the redeveloped section of Cabrini, how the construction could be used to hire residents and support resident-owned businesses. They discussed the ideal blend of public housing and market rate units in the mixed income replacement buildings. Tenants wanted the rebuild to include the maximum number of public housing units, and the city argued that there was a threshold at which the neighborhood could lose the stability and diversity it had recently gained. The city hoped the mix in the new buildings would hew closer to a realtor rule of thumb than white people wouldn't move into any neighborhood that was more than 30 percent black. The residents wanted guarantees that they could stay in the area, even during construction. The city insisted that it had to be supportive of the private developers who would build the mixed income housing and take on the risk of selling or renting out a majority of the units. In the end, Everyone agreed to the demolition of the three towers. In the new buildings replacing them, 40% of the units will be reserved for public housing families. The proposal also earmarked funds for a battery of new and improved social services for a resident-owned security company and for job training and other resident businesses. Mayor Daly sent the group a letter in support of their application and one of the Cabrini leaders called it a, quote, marvelous plan. It will better the community and give us pride, end quote. Vince Lane didn't have the opportunity to see this marvelous plan come into being. In May 1995, HUD seized control of the CHA, forcing out Lane as part of a federal takeover of the agency. The CHA had long been a stalwart of dysfunction, remaining on HUD's troubled housing authority list since the designation began in 1978. In its most recent evaluation, the CHA managed a score of just 50 out of 100. New York City, with 180,000 units of public housing, scored in the 90s. HUD saw that Lane has spent $74 million on sweeps and other security measures over the past year, and still CHA residents were twice as likely as other Chicagoans to be victims of a serious crime. Employees of the agency were caught in various schemes involving ghost workers, falsified overtime records, and overcharging for supplies. Lane believed he was targeted because Mayor Daley saw him as a political threat. A few years after being ousted from the agency, he was convicted for making false statements on a loan application tied to the development of a Southside shopping center. For the violation, Lane's lawyer said he deserved at most probation, since no one suffered a financial loss. But Lane received a two-and-a-half-year prison sentence. For many... The punishment seemed excessive. Lane certainly thought so. Quote, Daly killed me off, period, end quote. Cabrini residents adapted, joining with others to evaluate the developers bidding on the redevelopment of the nine-acre site. 
In the meantime, the city went ahead and tore down 1,117 through 1,119 North Cleveland, the home of the Castle crew, the building Brother Bill frequented, and where Dolores Wilson and her family had lived when they came to Cabrini in 1956. The building has stood for 39 years, and it was the first Cabrini high-rise to be demolished. Its demise was cause for both celebration and reflection, hope and concern. Afternoon. Then, suddenly, Cabrini residents who'd been involved in the redevelopment partnership for two years were shut out of meetings. They were told they'd be consulted in due time. Months passed. In June 1996, Mayor Daley made a public announcement about a revised development plan for the neighborhood that differs significantly from the previous one. Flamed by politicians and planners, but notably no Cabrini Green residents, he said eight Cabrini Towers would now be demolished, not three. The building would be much larger, spreading to other nearby plots of land, and would add 2,300 units of housing and townhomes and three flats, restoring the street grid and including new schools, a police station, a shopping center, and an expanded park. Just 15% of the units under Daly's proposal would be available to very low-income families, representing a net loss of nearly 1,000 public housing homes. The plan seemed less like the redevelopment of the Cabrini Extension Towers than a public-private push to accelerate gentrification in an area abutting the city center. Quote, how can they take our roots from us without our input? End quote. Dolores' daughter, Cheryl, asked, quote, they're planning to move the poor and destitute and build for rich folks. End quote. Five years earlier, in 1991, residents at the Henry Horner Homes had sued the CHA and HUD accusing them of, quote, de facto demolition, end quote, allowing the vacancy rate to reach 50 percent and conditions to degrade so much that there was nothing left to do but tear down the buildings. In a 1995 settlement, the city was forced into a consent decree that dictated the terms of Horner's redevelopment. At Cabrini, tenants had trusted that their city partners would hold up their side of an agreement. But at Horner, the city was bound by a court order. More than half of the units were reserved for very low-income families. Demolition and construction were staggered, and residents never had to cope with an involuntary relocation. So in 1996, Cabrini tenants sued as well. Twenty-two charges in all, accusing the Daly administration and the CHA of violating the 1968 Fair Housing Act, which made it illegal to use federal money to maintain racial segregation, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the U.S. Housing Act, the Community Development Block Grant Agreement, and the HOPE 6 statute. To the surprise of city government, a U.S. district judge listened to testimony and in January 1997 ruled against the CHA's motion to dismiss the lawsuit. 18 of the 22 counts could go forward, and he issued an injunction halting further demolish demolition at Cabrini Green until the case was heard. It was a victory for tenants. Quote, there is a God up above, end quote. Cora Moore said. That brings us to a changing of the theme within this chapter. We got one more, a few more pa uh, paragraphs left in this chapter will be over. And, and one of the things that stands out within the readings of these passages is just the type of neglect that was being put forth by these different institutions that were in charge of public housing, the different organizations that was in charge of public housing, by the political system, by the individuals that worked in these institutions, just for decades upon decades, as was pointed out here, for 39 years, there was, and even before that, because we read about when they were building the towers, how they took short shortcuts to build the towers, how they compromised in building the towers, by how much space they were supposed to have. And so we've seen since the inception of this, these public housing, all the way to what's now getting to be the destruction of them, that there has not been any genuine effort put forth on a whole scale to give these people equal living conditions, to give these people equal and equitable life opportunities. And now when, as they're getting ready to destroy them, they're going to not try to 
put these things back up or put this put the Cabrini homes back together in a way that will be beneficial to the residents who have sacrificed while being in that area, who have lost uh, people while being in that area, who have been traumatized, who this area is their home for. They're just going to push those people to the side and bring in a gentrified uh, resident residents to be in that area. And again, one of the reasons that that they could even attempt to do this is because of the lack of power that the people in these situations have. And uh, all right, let's let's move on to the next passage. Dolores Wilson. Before the filing of the lawsuit, and even before the rehab of 1230 North Burling was finished, Dolores Wilson decided to step down as president of her building's management corporation. She was 64 in 1993 and tired. She'd been helping run her high rise for more than a decade, and since Huber's death, her calendar had been filled from one year to the next. When she announced her resignation, Bertha Gilkey persuaded her to stick around a little longer. Quote, just another month, end quote, Gilkey urged, long enough to see through the repairs of the building's roof. Then a month passed, and Gilkey asked her to wait until other construction contracts were signed. Then she needed Dolores to travel to Washington with her to speak to lawmakers about resident management. Dolores knew she had trouble saying no. Her pastor would always ask her to go somewhere, and what, she, and what could she do? She'd go. Finally, Dolores was allowed to hand off the presidency to one of her neighbors. She left the water department around the same time. The city was offering early retirement, and after 27 years at the job, Dolores took it. The head of microscopy was from Bulgaria, and to Dolores, she sounded just like Zaza Gabor. Quote, this is your day, Dolores. Stop filing papers. Come here, end quote, she said. She led Dolores to a long table at the department covered with food, and people from all the laboratories came by to wish her farewell. That was a week or two before Michael Jordan's father was killed. For years to come, that's how Dolores would place the date, because she sent the Bull Star sympathy card, and he sent her a thank you in return. She'd gathered all the children in the Burling building to write condolences as well. She told them not to beg Jordan for anything, just to write that they were very sorry to hear about his daddy. But one of them asked for a bike. That boy used to break the wings off pigeons, and Dolores told his stepfather that children who were allowed to torture little animals would get the feeling of death in them. Eventually, it wouldn't mean anything to the child to cripple or kill a person. That's how Jeffrey Dahmer, the Milwaukee cannibal, got started, she explained. But the boy later became a preacher. Quote, good things can come out of bad, I guess, end quote, Dolores said. Quote, I think I at least saved some animal lives, end quote. Dolores had a harder time recalling exactly when her own Michael, her second child, died. Quote, some things you just can't, end quote. She tried not to think about his death, but guessed it happened two years earlier, maybe in 1991. Mike was almost 40 then and divorced. He had four children and was also raising his girlfriends two as his own. He was with the girlfriend on a summer night at a Chicago Avenue sandwich shop by the row houses. He went to buy cigarettes at a gas station on Orleans, and when he returned, the guy who used to date his girlfriend was threatening her, saying he bashed her head in with the bottle. Quote, one thing about my sons, end quote, Dolores would say, with a mix of pride and sorrow, quote, they protect their women, they're gallant, end quote. The two men came to blows, and Mike ended up on top. That's when one of the ex-boyfriend's associates pulled out a gun and shot Michael in the back, close range, with a hollow point bullet. It seemed utterly unfair to Dolores. She had dedicated much of her life to the community and the neighborhood children. She'd received service awards from her church and the YMCA. The district police honored her and Sugar Ray Dinky on the same day. Jack Kemp had personally named her the HUD, quote, resident of the year, end quote. All that, and look what happened to her own baby. Michael's children were left fatherless. In her grief, Dolores wanted to be left alone, but the visitors kept coming. She sat little in front of them, even joked, but then she closed herself in the bathroom and screamed. Someone had to explain to her what a hollow point bullet was, how it expanded as it traveled inside the body. 
Hearing that made her think differently about people. One of the members of her church had a 25-year-old daughter who gone missing for three months a couple of years earlier. The police refused to look for her, saying, quote, You sure she's not laid up with someone? End quote. The daughter had been murdered, it turned out. Her body left to decay in a sewer two blocks away. The woman had a son as well who'd been shot in the back behind one of the Cabrini high-rises. That mother said to Dolores, quote, Miss Wilson, you always told me to keep the faith. Now you have to keep the faith. End quote. The pastor from Holy Family counseled Dolores, saying she was the most forgiving person he'd ever known. At the funeral service, Dolores stood in front of the congregation and said she didn't want any retaliation. She asked that Michael's friends and other folks from the building pass along that message. She attended the trial, and when the ex-boyfriend was found not guilty, she hugged and kissed his mother, telling her she knew he didn't do the killing. She felt less compassion for the shooter. He was found guilty of second-degree murder and sentenced to seven years. Dolores' youngest son, Kenny, had broken into a car trunk once and stolen a few tools and received the same sentence. Quote, there's no justice, end quote, she would say. Quote, a game banger got seven years for killing my son, and Kenny got seven years for stealing a damn screwdriver and wrench, end quote. Dolores had been hosting family reunions in Lincoln Park every August for a decade, but she stopped after Michael was murdered. Sometimes she wished her children had moved away, had left Chicago and stayed in Indiana or another place. But she didn't blame Cabrini Green. She didn't imagine her children would have lived a better life elsewhere. A reporter who interviewed her three days after Michael's funeral asked if there was anything she wanted to convey to outsiders about her home. Dolores paused to think. She guessed she did have a message. Quote, tell them that there's more love over here than terrorizing. End quote. And that brings us to the end of chapter 12, beginning of chapter 13. And at what are the excuse me? What of the overwhelming themes that's been inside this book has been uh, one of loss. You know, there's there's also been an overwhelming theme of hope as well and of struggle, but the the amount of loss that has existed for people in Cabrini Green has been something that, you know, is uh, hard to, to not speak about or hard to not take away after, after reading. I think one of the things that I'm, I always think of when we, speak, when we read these passages about loss is how many of these incidents, these situations, these events could be avoided by the circumstances that people are living in being different, by the situations that people are living in being different, by uh, and and we see pointed out in here too when Dolores Wilson speaks about how her son was given uh, the same sentence as. Uh, a man who killed one of her other sons, her son for breaking into a car and stealing a wrench and stealing some, you know, work tools, he would be given seven years in prison the same way that the man who shot and murdered her other son would be given seven years in pr prison. And that gets back to the, the, the hypocrisies that exist within mass incarceration and that exists within these these systems and and that's what goes to delegitimizing these institutions of police the delegitimizing the institution of supposed criminal justice system is because once you begin to see it at multiple different angles when you don't only see it just from being the plaintiff or the person pressing charges but you also see it as being the person having those charges pressed against you when you don't just see it from one event or a singular event but when you see multiple people go through the system you begin to see how flawed the system really is and how the system is uh not put together in an equitable or fair or just manner at all uh, from for multiple different reasons and and again just the amount of the amount of of loss is something that stands out very heavily as well uh, okay, so we're starting chapter 13. 
If not here, where? Kelvin Cannon. Kelvin Cannon got off the elevator one morning on his way out of the building and Cora Moore blocked his path. When he was a boy, living next door in 714 West Division, Moore often scolded him for fighting with the children in her high rise. He was now 26 and she still reprimanded him. She was in charge of resident security at 1230 North Burling and he called it for the gangster disciples there. Quote, you should get on my team, end quote, Cora began that morning in 1989. Quote, do you want to be out here and be free and raise your family? Then you have to leave game banging alone, end quote. She'd been, de- she'd been delivering the same pitch for a couple of years, trying to recruit him away from the game. Quote, what I'm offering, they can't offer you. I'm offering a chance at a better way of life, end quote. Cannon lingered in the lobby longer than usual. He'd been wondering lately whether there were other options available to someone like him, thinking that probably there were none. He managed to avoid a return to the penitentiary, but he was tired of the police raids, of going back and forth to jail for weeks at a time. Cora, sensing the opening, told Kelvin that he was smarter than most. She said the building's resident management was getting started and he could be one of its leaders. He could work right there in the high rise. Like Bo John had made him believe when he was 13, Moore said he could be a part of something bigger than himself. Quote, if you really want to change, help me fix the building, end quote, she told him. Quote, let me show you the other side of life, end quote. Quote, okay, end quote, he said. Quote, show me, end quote. Cannon went to the leaders of the disciples and said he was resigning his position. Moore talked to the commander at the police precinct and said Cannon was now working under her. She signed him up for a security guard class. In prison, he read the Bible, first the New Testament and then the Old, and he continued to school himself after his release, looking at a dictionary in his apartment, working on his vocabulary and spelling. But he hadn't been in the classroom since he was kicked out of Cooley High. He completed the security guard program, and in his uniform and cap, he monitored the stairwells and ramps of high-rises. Some thought it hypocritical that after all Cannon had done, he was telling eight-year-olds to stop fooling around on the elevators and directing young men to move from in front of the building. But he said he'd always been in charge of people at Cabrini Green and giving orders in one form or another. He was only doing more of the same. Quote, you turn police? End quote. A guy from the building asked him, quote, nah, my brother, I'm trying a new way of, I'm trying a new way of life. End quote. He was one of the few men to go through the resident management classes with Bertha Gilkey. On the weekend retreats, he sang, quote, we shall overcome, end quote, with Dolores Wilson and everyone else. And he studied budgeting and federal housing regulations. He went along on the trips to see the other tenant managed housing complex in Boston, D.C., and St. Louis. Like Dolores, he came to know politicians personally, quote, I haven't forgotten my pledge to be your bridge to HUD in the city of Chicago, end quote. The Secretary of Housing wrote in a note asking about the well-being of Cannon's wife and signing it. Quote, oh, number 15, Jack Kemp, your friend, end quote. Moore used her connections to get Cannon into a training course for CHA janitors. He apprenticed at Cabrini Green, shadowing the electricians, carpenters, glazers, and locksmiths. He did masonry and brick laying, whatever the buildings needed. For two years, he took night classes at a trade school. After graduating, he started off at $11 an hour, but when he was put in charge of the janitors in 1230 North Burling as a union worker, he earned $17,000 a year plus benefits. That was good money in all senses. He earned it as a day-in, day-out laboring professional on call 24 hours a day. He barely left the high-rise, and he'd become more like Hubert Wilson Dolores' husband than his old self. He joined a church and trained to be a deacon. Cannon took pride in his high rises improvements. Quote, it looked better than any other building in Chicago that was public housing, end quote, he'd brag. Quote, you know how in that Ajax commercial they go past certain houses that are all grimy and filthy, then they come to the real clean house, it's spotless. The music stops and a woman says, Ajax was here. That was our building like Ajax have been there, end quote. Okay. And 
we're going to go ahead and end this episode with that passage reading right there. We a little bit under our 30 minute mark, but we got a changing in the themes of the book here or changing the themes of the chapter here. So again, one of the things that we've seen is the the growth of of different individuals in Cabrini Green and in public housing and we've seen the avenues and the things that were presented to them to help them have the opportunity to reach that growth. Uh, okay, I would encourage you to listen to previous episodes of Ride for Reading Daily if you have not listened to those. And I would uh, ask you to listen to future episodes of Ride for Reading Daily if by the time you get a hold of this we have future episodes out. Uh, reminder, we put these episodes out on a daily basis to present people the opportunity to either begin or further on their journey in the struggle to end police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. Uh, I will be talking to you all tomorrow, and we outside.